It's a sermon by John Calvin, and it's, it shows how one ought to take pains to obtain freedom to serve God purely in the Christian church, and it's based on the theme of Psalm 27. So you may want to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27. The text that he is focusing on is, Mine heart, mine heart has said of thee, Seek ye my face. I will seek thy face, O Lord. As men, when they give rein to their appetites and desires, cast themselves headlong into an amazing confusion, it is their great wisdom to inquire as to what God commands them to do to follow Him. We have a fine example of that here. David was certainly a man subject to the very passions which torment us and drive us to and fro. He was no doubt tried by many temptations which were capable of leading his spirit astray. But as a remedy against all occasions of debauchery and to have a safe conduct, he considers what God sets before him. He meditates and ruminates upon it. The sum of the matter is that God invites and exhorts all the faithful to seek his face. David declares that he has applied himself to performing this command. Thus, there was a sweet melody and a sweet harmony between God who speaks saying, Seek me. And him that responds, Yes, my God, I will seek thee. Now we should observe here why God uses the word face. If he had no face whereby he revealed himself, he would be misleading us and commanding us to seek it. I realize that many who are inclined to be clever will make no more of this than if God, or than if it said, seek me. But those who are well exercised in the scripture are well aware that God wanted to specify the manner he has always used to reveal and declare himself directly to men. And indeed, it is very frequent scriptural language to call the sanctuary and the Ark of the Covenant the face of God. Why is this? It is because God, who is incomprehensible in his essence and majesty, uses means which he knows to be suitable to their weakness and simplicity to lead men to himself. It is true that the world is always making false images of God, but whatever we dream up in our head are just so many masks which disguise God. Or to speak more plainly, when men make themselves any image or likeness in order to make God visible, they have only a dead idol. When, however, God represents himself according to his good pleasure, when he gives us signs and marks so that he may be known by us, then he assumes a face. He commands that each of us set our gaze upon that face and that we take care to consider it. For to enjoy the likeness of our God is our supreme good, with which we should be completely satisfied, as it says in the 16th Psalm, verse 11. Now, since we cannot climb so high without a ladder, the second greatest good he can do to us is to give us the means to reach the first one. So let us note that the place where God says, Seek my face, is tantamount to his opening the door to make us enter into eternal life. It might not seem that it was such a great matter to go to the temple in David's time and see whatever ceremonies were done there. Yet if we think well of the spiritual pattern that Moses was shown in the mountain, we will not find it strange that God says that it is his face. And indeed, since Jesus Christ was revealed there, what shall we say except that God revealed himself there? Now let us see if God has not ordained an outward means for us to contemplate. It is true that he appeared to us through his Son, who is his living image, and in whose perfection he desires to be perfectly known. Yet St. Paul also declares that the gospel is the mirror in which Jesus Christ must be seen in the fourth chapter of the second letter to the Corinthians, verse 4. The sacraments have like nature, and in some, so does the order which God has set in the church. 
Therefore, let the proud and boastful of this world laugh as much as they may please. But since God has done us this benefit of condescending to us, let us not be ashamed to do this honor to his word and sacraments, to regard him there as if face to face, not being restricted to the corruptible elements of the world here below, like the papists who make idols of all the symbols God has given us to lead us to Jesus Christ. Yet if we are ever to enjoy fully the presence of God, we must reach out to him by these lesser means. True, one must not take what I say too strictly, as if the faithful never draw near to God except when they come to the temple. That would be too silly a superstition. What I mean is that we must never set God above the clouds, as some fanciful people do, and speculate as we please concerning his lofty majesty, abandoning both the preaching of the gospel and other similar means, as if we could see him by closing our eyes. Truthfully, those who despise the usage of which I speak as much of the sacraments as of the rest of the church word do not deign to behold God when he appears to them. Let us consider now how needful it is for God to quicken us to come to him. We have already said what great grace and honor he does us by inviting us so sweetly to himself in order to promote our salvation and lead us to the true and perfect happiness from which we are far away in so much as concerns us. Yet we must also note that it is not without great necessity that God pricks and beseeches us to keep us from being eternally wretched. First of all, it is just a shame how distracted our sight is. Our senses are occupied only with the vanities of this world, and Satan has countless illusions which would, with which to deceive us. It is true that all his devices are merely masquerades, are farcical games and foolish amusements. Yet experience shows us how foolish and mad we are, letting ourselves be greatly seduced. Therefore, if we were well advised, this word of God would always be ringing in our ears. Seek my face. But what do we see? As God is painstaking for his part, we are lazy and slow. What to God, we were not wayward horses to back up instead of going forward. Thus, this example is not set before us in vain. For David's declaration that he has, that he has meditated in his heart on this teaching, that he and all the faithful should seek the face of God, shows us what we should apply ourselves to, so that God may not lose his trouble in calling us to himself. He brings together two items worthy of notice. The first is that when God spoke, saying, Seek my face, he answered this voice with a good, hearty affection. The second is that after having said yes, he says that he will apply himself by deeds to seek the face of God. And indeed, behold the order according to which we should proceed. We must give openness and access to what God says to us, as also we are shown in the Psalm 95, verses 7 through 8. Today, hearing his voice, harden not your hearts, but there are precious few who obey. To excuse themselves, many will say, yes, that is, that is right. It is not allowed to answer back. But what they agree to with their mouth is very far from entering into their heart. So let us learn to begin by responding to God cheerfully, that we have heard the good he means to do to us, inviting us to behold his face. If we have that, the rest must follow with it. That is, power to do what we know is commanded us so justly and for our singular good. David shows that he had no cold or dead meditation without moving either arms or legs, 
Rather, having concluded that it was necessary to seek God, he got underway and says he will press on. Now, it is a great disgrace to such as call themselves Christians to perform both of these points so poorly. Some point out that they may not lawfully leave the land of their birth, despite being destitute of the pasture of life there, where there is only desolation as far as the order of the church is concerned. Why can they not leave? Because of the duty they have to their earthly prince. I will not make a lengthy reply to this. I will only ask them if they would not be or if they would be stopped by such a scruple if they had nothing to eat or drink at home. There are none who would not boldly permit themselves to leave their country in order not to die of hunger. Now I offer a case which is not so clear. If they were offered six times as many goods in a foreign country, they would have no great problem leaving promptly to take possession. So what good does it do them to raise these colors? Since one clearly sees that they are talking about something which is very far from their heart. Here it is not a matter of withdrawing to the land of an enemy, where they might be constrained to bear arms against their prince and to make war against their native country. It is only a matter of seeking a place to serve God in peace, somewhere where nothing would keep them from praying for their prince or for his subjects. In short, such a relocation is no different from those which are regularly made for earthly conveniences without anyone thinking it's a crime. However, let us see if necessity does not provide an excuse. God says, seek my face. The princes of the earth snap back and want people to turn their backs on him. They deprive poor souls of their ordinary pasture. And in the place of the face of God, they set superstitious masks before men's eyes. Must they be preferred to the living God? If one hearkens to God, he must rather go a thousand leagues to see God's face than to languish in his nest. So, whenever and whatever princes may undertake against him, who has full sovereign authority over them, one does them no wrong in obeying him. However, in addition to what I have said, such people show that they have scarcely given any thought to their own condition. In what sort of captivity do they lie? If their conscience were not fast asleep, it would be impossible for them not to be in continual distress, as if they were undergoing the torments of hell. Are they at all allowed to honor God in their households? One need go no further than their home to see. If a child is born to one of them, it is his duty to offer him to God with prayers and thanksgiving, asking that his body be marked with the sign of salvation by baptism. But we know that baptism is so corrupted in the papacy and so jumbled up with superstitions and nonsense that a child cannot receive it without being polluted. Thus the father would not be able to have his child baptized without sinning. If he foregoes it, it will still be sin. For the offense is only or for the offense is only rejecting the sacrament that the Son of God has instituted. Oh what a great perplexity is this. To be to be able neither to do an act nor to leave it undone without offending God in it. I am going to let the rest go, because this one example is already more than enough. Now a man living in these conditions ends up living his whole life languishing in misery and not knowing which way to turn. Yet the greatest losses occur at death when the devil will get all he has. If a poor captive was formally prevented from serving God out of concern for his wife and his children, it is now worse than ever. They who are uncertain whether it is permissible to get out of such a mire or rather such a hellhole, by reason of their submission to earthly princes, turn the laws of nature quite upside down. 
Certainly the prayer God would have us offer for our princes is agreeable to the authority he assigns over them, or he assigns them over us, and to the duty toward them which he requires of us. Well, St. Paul exhorts us to pray to God for kings and magistrates, that we may lead a peaceable life in all honesty and in the fear of God. It is therefore overstretching the submission one owes to earthly princes to want the honor and service of the heavenly king to be cut back. It is true that the poor Jews remained in the captivity of Babylon until the time that had been appointed for them to leave. But let these people with whom I am debating show that we are bound to willingly deprive ourselves of the spiritual good which God gives his children. They feel the pressure of their need. Their weakness beckons. God shows them the remedy. What reason is there for them not to help themselves in order to please those who snatch the food out of their, out of their mouth? It is very different concerning husbands uh, with regard to wives and vice versa. For inasmuch as God has joined them together as one flesh, it would not do for one to abandon the other on the pretext of seeking God. Not that they should wander from him in order to be together, but rather each one should take every pain to draw his mate to them. So here is what they must do. The husband must point out to his wife how unhappy they are being separated from the company of the faithful having neither preaching nor sacraments, which are the signs to assure us that God is dwelling with us. He thereupon urges her to summon her courage. And if he cannot win her over as quickly as he would like, he does not weary of persuading her until he gets the job done. Even if his wife disagrees with him, let him not stop persisting with her until she shows herself altogether obstinate. If, after having done all he can, he can no longer stand it there, he is free and clear. He has acquitted himself of his duty and has not clung to her because his wife did not follow him as she is bound to do. However, such a parting is not a divorce. Rather, the husband goes ahead to show his wife the way. As for the woman, she has a tighter bond because she is not the head. She must therefore try every means possible to her to induce her husband to set them both at liberty. When she has done all she can, she is still not free to leave the one to whom she is subject, unless there arise some persecution and there be some evident danger, especially if the husband is like a firebrand pursuing her to death. Now she would not be leaving her husband, but fleeing from the ill that surrounded her and the rage of enemies, in accord with God's permission and leave. In short, the constraint laid on her delivers her and frees her. Therefore, no concern in the world should control either the husband or the wife, but only the love they owe each other in God, which should move them to seek one another's salvation. For if a man must forget himself with regard to this earthly life and the body, he surely must also forget what is round about him. Let us return to the high esteem in which David holds seeking the face of God, as he also speaks of it in the 84th Psalm, verse 10, saying, that it is better to live a single day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand being far away. He hereby indicates that the life of the faithful could not be too short as long as God does leave them this kindness. But while they live in this world, they apply themselves to serve and honor him, to confirm themselves in his promises and to confess his name. If someone replies that this can be done in a desolate place, or among the enemies of the faith. I answer that it is not for nothing that David speaks of the courts of the temple, 
For he considers how necessary the order of the church is to all mortal, all mortal men, given the simplicity and the weakness which is in them. If this saying were well impressed upon all hearts, namely to come to a Christian church where they can die in peace, everyone would soon have his bag packed. But what do we find? As long to live, and that at their ease, and each one according to the lust which leads him. Sorry about that, I'll reread that. I got it wrong. All long to live, and that at their ease, and each one according to the lust which leads them. This is the reason why the temple of God is despised. Furthermore, many are very clever about setting evil objects before their eyes to lure themselves away from David's affection. They say, what good will it do us to move? We will find the world wherever we go just as well as it exists in our country. Everything is corrupted today. There are offenses and temptations to unfaithfulness on every side. I grant them all that. If, however, it were a matter of their bodies, and someone told them where they might find good doctors, suitable medicines, and other helps, would they say that that did not interest them? Because one can fall ill in it everywhere? I grant that wherever one may be, he will encounter opportunities to do evil and plenty of debauchery. Yet there is a great difference between having the means of God or having the means God has given us to restrain and correct us and being altogether without them. Let us suppose that all vices reign equally in the world and that the air is infected with them as with a plague. Is it not a great advantage to have the preserving measures which God has ordained for his children? To have the purges and medicines for with, with which he desires to heal us? I mean the teaching of the gospel when it is preached. The sacraments when they are rightly practiced. Public prayer. And that which serves to quicken and awaken us so we may not be poisoned by the temptations of this world. Everyone knows that there is none of this in the papacy. Quite the contrary. So let us be sure that since we have need of such succor, we not reject the succor that God has offered us. There are some who express their distaste more plainly. What would we do in a church where we would see troubles and offenses which are currently unheard of among us? If in the places where the gospel is preached, there were good order necessary to edify us, and we were assured of only encountering the angels we expect in paradise, we would be moved to hasten there. But when we arrive, we will hear of many things that will only offend us, and we will see more of them than is necessary. There will be, there will be plenty of degenerate people who dishonor the gospel by their dissolute life. Vanities, pomp, drunkenness, and such like will be greatly in fashion. What is worse, many will show themselves to be such great despisers of God that one will see a greater impiety there than among the papists. There will be as much abuse and corruption of justice there as elsewhere. One will even find much to criticize in the life of the preachers. <clears throat> Some will be indifferent. For they will be so involved in their personal gain that they will not care at all about their office. What is worse, there are revelers who ask only for a feast and become allies of the most wicked people in order to be able to live in style. Now let us suppose that it is ten times as bad. It is still a trivial excuse for those who bar their own way to avoid coming to the church of God. So be it. Let us set our eyes on David's example. I ask you, during the time of Saul, was there such integrity in the area of justice as one might desire? On the contrary, we hear the complaints of David. 
We hear the complaints that David often makes concerning the malice, the fraud, the cruelty, and pride of both the king and of his officers. Did the priests and Levites conduct themselves so holily that there was a reason to be satisfied with it? We may rather gather that most of them adhered to the wicked side and nurtured iniquity through their flattery. Among the commoners, there was much hypocrisy and open vice. So here we have a church of God full of many corruptions. Yet David is not at all displeased to enter it, and the desire he has to do so does not grow cold. I grant that the temptation is wonderfully hard. The greater zeal one has for the honor of God, the greater reason he has to be saddened and troubled, seeing the shame we bring on God by polluting his church. But David shows us the remedy to overcome all that. It is to seek the face of God, and to take such satisfaction from a single gaze upon it, that despite all that Satan stirs up to offend us, we on the contrary conclude that there is nothing more beautiful and desirable than dwelling in the temple where one sees it. Thus, however often and however many such offenses confront us, let us recall that it is Satan who works his usual schemes to cloud our vision. Let us be wise about this and not be diverted from seeing the face of God, so that seeing it, we may completely rejoice. The poor idolaters should make us greatly ashamed. For if one of them, having wasted his money and consumed his body, in hard work to make a foolish pilgrimage, were to arrive there and find an army demanding ransom, a brick batter's damaging it, and priests insulting it, were he in some to find total confusion. Yet for all that, for all that his devotion would not change. For he would say that he had come to see and worship either the body of the Holy Blessed One or the image of Our Lady, or some collection of relics. Shall the mere view of a corpse or a gargoyle have more power to keep the unbelievers stubborn in their superstitions than the face of God has over us to make us steadfast in doing good? We see one thing and another which are hurtful to us. God calls us back to himself and desires for us to take such pleasure from beholding his face that we may endure everything else patiently. Therefore, let the shield and refuge of all true believers be to cling to the face of God, however Satan may scheme to distract them. And when we learn to prize it according to its worth, no price will seem too great. Although, to tell the truth, most people are not so much hindered by scruples as with difficulties which concern the body. Not that the children of God do not have serious conflicts of conscience when they find offenses in the Reformed churches, like those of which we have spoken. However, those who are deliberating about moving to places where the gospel is preached must be advised of the bad things that await them and prepare to withstand them. But those who have experienced these things also strengthen themselves and continue to seek God's face despite Satan. However, when all is said and done, the only thing that holds most people back is pure defiance. And as men are good at making excuses, rich people find them here and poor people there. A great landowner will say, how shall I deprive myself of all this that I have? And shall I depart, stripped of all my possessions? I have a wife and children, we are accustomed to eat well without working. What will we do in a foreign country where we will have neither rents nor income? The poor man will say just the opposite. Here I have precious little, but I have my friends who are good to me. I am challenged to live by my labor. What will I do in a foreign country without a cent or anything close, not knowing anyone, being without anyone's favor or support? And these excuses may be partly true. And without inquiring into this any further, I grant them all 
I grant them all that it is very troublesome to leave not only the place of one's birth, but the place to which one is accustomed. So they dream up ways to hinder themselves from coming to God. That is, although they do not find things as hard as they make them out to be, they are quite content to excuse themselves with any sort of excuse. What is more, when they have made these pretty complaints, they think they have stopped God's mouth. And then if he presses them any further, he does them a great wrong, as if he constrained them to do something impossible. To this I have no other answer than what is written in the 84th Psalm, verse 6. Namely, that the faithful, passing through the dry valleys and the deserts to come to the temple of God, dig themselves wells or cisterns. And I think it is quite sufficient to overcome those who do care to answer back to God. Therefore, let those who find themselves so beset with difficulties that there is no path or trial. Remember that even the desert places where no drop of water is to be found must not stop their way. To understand this matter more clearly, let us note that God would not have his children seek him through lovely meadows or pretty pleasant woods, but by way of harsh and rough regions, through sand pits and moors, through foul and horrible regions, and all this to exercise their faith, to prove the zeal and the desire they have to reach him. Therefore, although we cannot come to God without passing through some desert place or along some untamed road, let us recognize that God did not just start today to deal with his believers like this. And let us take heart to follow after those who have gone before us so long ago. The second point is that the children of God should have such a great ardor that nothing can make them turn aside from coming to worship Him. We see this today in precious few. Indeed, almost everyone is so delicate that a, lot, a little trifle is all it takes to stop them in their tracks. I cannot proceed further, they say. Why? because they do not deign to take trouble to climb over a little obstacle. One must conclude their zeal to be very weak when it is so easily abated. Now, since we get sidetracked so readily, we must arm ourselves against the greatest obstacles on earth. To do this, let us remember this lesson, that God only acknowledges as his children those who seek him by the way of dry and arid lands and who dig wells where there was not a drop of water. Now this saying tells us that there is no trouble or hardship that we are not supposed to endure in order to enjoy the face of God. So is it a matter of seeking a place where one has liberty to serve God and worship him purely? <coughs> Whatever the hardship that lies between two points, let one not fail to set out on the journey. Is one hungry and thirsty and root? Yet one must not turn aside. Let no one laugh at me as if I were talking about this however I please. For it is the Spirit of God who teaches us to go scraping and crawling upon the earth rather than being turned aside or drawing back from coming to the temple of God. Now, if they are all without excuse, who are in a far-off land and are kept by the world from every means of relocating to a country where the gospel is preached, I ask you, what condemnation must await those who have the gospel at their door and do not deign to take one step to enter the temple? The gospel is preached daily. Prayers are offered, and one need only to take the road over the brook to attend. And everyone says he has something going on at home. In short, it, may, it seems that many people base their happiness on keeping themselves from God, for they suppose they have won everything when they come up with an utterly trivial excuse. 
Now, since the fact of the matter is that we are so inclined to keep ourselves far from God, indeed, to depart after he has drawn near to us, let us pray to him, asking him to strengthen us in such wise that we may walk boldly on until we find fountains where there was nothing but dryness before. And should that fail, let us dig cisterns waiting for rain from heaven. If God is not pleased to promptly send us his aid, let us not fail to proceed onward. I think many people will find this hard to understand. But why is that? Why only for lack of practicing it? Though they preach to us for a hundred thousand years, we will not understand a word until we learn by experience what it is to go by a dry road on our way to God. This teaching, to prepare and arm themselves against all the temptations that Satan can concoct to stop up the path that leads them to God, should therefore be familiar to all believers. And indeed, all who faithfully occupy themselves seeking God, although they do not budge from their place, will not fail to have many bad experiences which would cause them to turn aside if they did not have a steadfast heart to endure. Sadly, however, many, as I said, let themselves be overwhelmed by the hardships which present themselves to them. <clears throat> they will say, it has to be done, and they will appear to be firmly determined. Yet their heart fails them in the time of need. And most often, those who began well will grow weary in the midst of the journey. We must therefore remember all the more this lesson about digging wells, that is, seeking ways that are not at all obvious and to always continue onward. Let us push ourselves, I say, beyond all mere human power. If things do not go according to our liking, let us not stop going on patiently in the good way which God, in which God has set us. If we call upon God in true faith, he will surely be able to transform the deserts and the streams. However, we should also set our hands to the task, as the saying goes. For God would not have us remain idle, moving neither hands or feet. Rather, he commands us to dig the wells. So let us labor at digging until we have completed our journey. Consider the poor, miserable soldiers who sell their lives for so much a month. If they are in the camp, what hardships they endure. If they are under siege, it is worse yet. If they are in the field, there is neither cold nor heat nor wind nor rain which prevents them from doing their task. Sometimes it gets to the point where they will not have a drop to drink unless they find water. There is neither labor nor shortage nor mishap to which they must not go. Have they done all they can? Whether they get out of it or not, they have wasted their efforts since they were only serving Satan. The Son of God, by his infinite grace, has chosen us to be his soldiers. We know what reward he has prepared for us. How much more courageous ought we to be in his service than those poor wretches whose efforts only serve to accomplish their own ruin? Now, it is not merely a matter of each one calculating how many leagues it is from his house to the place where he may worship God freely, confess his faith, and hear the pure doctrine the gospel preached. We have a much longer road to travel, which will last all our lives. Have we frequented the temple of God for a year or more? As we continue, we shall in daily encounter new deserts. For one time we'll be, we will be afflicted with illness, another with poverty. Our wife or our children will die. The means for serving God, which we had formerly enjoyed, uh, will be taken from us. We will be preoccupied with unrest and various troubles. It is therefore required that right up to the end, 
We keep our hands ready to burrow wells and our nails ready to scratch at the ground if need be. If someone protests, what are you saying? Are not we, or are we not in God's temple? I answer that we are here for every man to draw near and enter in every day. We behold the face of God, but we are not yet satisfied with it, as we shall be when once he has gathered us to himself. Therefore, all must apply this to their own practice. And as Satan never stops hindering all those who follow after God, let every man strengthen himself to continue doing tomorrow what he has done today. For if the enemy does not grow weary of trying to make us fall back, so much the less should we lose our courage to press forward, gathering new strength constantly and ceaselessly. To do this, one must have an affection like David's engraved upon his heart. I would rather, he says, dwell at the doorway of the house of God than in the tents and the pavilions of the wicked. By this he is saying that he would be quite content to be abased and made contemptible in order to get the blessing of dwelling in the house of God. Let us consider, I beseech you, what his position was. He was the son-in-law of the king and one of the chief men of the land. Yet he is willing to be demoted to the lowest ranks of the common people, providing that he can have some little corner in the temple. If this desire reigned in all believers, they would not have so much trouble disentangling themselves and would not spend so much time haggling about the loss. The loss they must take, uh, or they must take leave of their homes and come to the church of God. Yet there are precious few who are willing and able to suffer losses. Everyone would like to be carried on a litter to worship God where there, where there is freedom to do so and would like for lands and possessions, goods and business connections and all other assets to follow right along. Now if they act this way, how highly do they esteem Jesus Christ? For all they care to do is to be paraded about at his request as if they were playing along which is a very low estimate of him indeed for even though we are worth nothing he by his infinite grace valued us very highly so much so that he did not spare himself for our salvation even he in whom all the perfection of every good thing lies Yet we feel bad about leaving behind some few perishable goods and about worsening our worldly condition so as not to live in quite the comfort we enjoyed before. This is very far from following the example of Saint, that St. Saint Paul has shown us. But everything that hindered, uh, hinders us from possessing Jesus Christ, we should account as, as rubbish and abandon it like something detestable. Knowing that whatever comes between us and the true life can only draw us toward death. It is also very far from heeding the exhortation given us by Jesus Christ to sell and abandon everything we have in the world for the kingdom of heaven. Knowing that it is a precious stone worth a hundred thousand times more than everything men supplies and desire. If someone objects, that one can certainly attain the kingdom of heaven without forsaking his house, I answer that it is not for nothing that our Lord speaks this way of the preaching of the gospel. Therefore, they who are deprived of the preaching of the gospel and are not concerned to seek out every possible means of enjoying it clearly show that they are overly bent on the things of this world and that they are not yet inclined to exchange them for the kingdom of heaven. If they could have both, I would not hold that against them. If, however, they cannot hold on to their possessions and, the snuggle, in their and snuggle in their nest without defrauding themselves of the pasture of the children of God, if they cannot maintain their present condition without cutting themselves off, 
from the church, then they must consider the necessity that God lays upon them. It is easy for them to bring forth all sorts of excuses. All that, however, will do them no good when the great judge shall thunder with his dreadful voice against all those who have loved their life on earth, which is common to us in the dumb animals, more than their eternal inheritance, which he has reserved for his children. It is strange that many suppose that we are wiring their mouths shut if we do not assign them their estate and means of living in their, new, in their new life serving God. They say, this is my condition in my country. If I leave it, what will become of me? And how shall I be fed? As if God had ordained preachers of the gospel to be hotel keepers, to put everyone up according to their class, revenue, wages. If we can help anyone by means of direction and counsel, we are bound to do so even if they do not seek it from us. But if it is beyond us, does that mean that we have lost the freedom to teach every man what God commands him to do? Although, if they had learned and retained this teaching from David, that they should love a little spot at the threshold of the temple of God more than the most lofty and honorable places which they might choose among unbelievers, they would not find it so hard to take advice. <clears throat> the problem is they want to maintain their current conditions without modification. And they cannot stand to be diminished in honor or riches nor to lose their comforts and luxuries. That is, they cannot bow the neck and humble themselves to bear Jesus Christ. Let them continue their pleading on, uh, pleading on this as long as they like. They must at last lose their case. As for those who have already left their countries to come to a place where they can serve God freely, where the gospel is preached to them faithfully, they really must remember this saying often and exercise themselves by practicing it day by day, becoming habituated by long years. For over time, many things may and indeed do come to pass, which would discourage even those who have great zeal. They who take their places in the churches of God are not always received as they deserve to be. Sometimes the social order is perverted so that those who might be worthy of being in the forefront are kept back. Such temptation could also make them draw back from their salvation, forsaking the good way that they have begun. If they did not find satisfaction in being the last and the lowest in the house of God rather than being excluded from it. So even though they do not have what they might wish, but on the contrary, are troubled in many ways by having left their country, let all the faithful learn to console themselves with this one thought. We are, nevertheless, in the house of God. Let the, now let the worldlings ridicule us as much as they please. Let them proudly label us as contemptible. It is enough that God does us this honor of reckoning us as of his palace and of his sanctuary. We see what lengths ambitious fools go to in order to be acknowledged as of the house of some prince and how they consider themselves happy if they can only enter the kitchen or the sitting room. Now, even if we are as rejected as can be, according to the world, Providing we are of the church of God, he let us in on the great secrets and marvels of his wisdom in the greatest intimacy as a father declares himself to his children. We are very ungrateful if this compensation does not satisfy us. It is true that the faithful can be tempted and pricked when their affairs go badly and the wicked exult in great prosperity. When, however, they consider that, on the other hand, God has chosen them to belong to his household and that he retains them there, this comfort is worth very little to them if it does not appease all the sorrows and griefs which may trouble them. And, though, and indeed, those who complain and engage in self-pity because God is not treating them as they like 
or who are sorry for the good beginning they made, show that they did not follow the direction of our Lord Jesus to count carefully when one begins build, to, build a temp, uh, to build a building, what it may cost to complete it, so that he will not be troubled by having spent too much and so that the building not end up uncompleted. What is worse? Most people who grow weary in the midst of the way do so for no particular reason. In this they are quite impudent. For those who had neither houses nor lands, for whom it was all the same whether they lived in their country or at the end of the world, are completely unashamed to reproach God, saying that they left behind this or that. Even in the event that they have lost their wealth for the gospel, it is still absurd, absurd to value a penny more than a dollar. However, one hears nothing but these complaints. And would to God that such folks were living comfortably far away from us. So neither rich nor poor have good grounds to turn aside because of the afflictions that befall them when they follow God. Now because this is very hard for us, we have a remedy in the 84th Psalm, verse 5, where David, after saying, blessed is the man that hopeth in God, adds, and in whose heart are the paths. That is to say, who has his heart set on walking as God commands. Here are two things which should not be separated from one another, putting our hope in God and going in the straight way. Therefore, as our weakness hinders us from proceeding forward, or even makes us so lazy that we would be willing to turn aside at any point, let us strengthen ourselves in faith and hope. Praying our good God to make us so behold him that nothing can bother us because we are grounded in his promises by which he assures us that he will be with us both in life and in death. Was read by Greg Darrell and was placed on tape by permission of the copyright holder, Presbyterian Heritage Publications. The sermon was taken from the book, Come Out From Among Them, The Anti-Nicodemite Writings of John Calvin. This book contains a number of sermons by Calvin which have been translated into English for the first time. Although the book is not to be available until the summer of 2001, Lord willing, uh, the text form of this book is now available on the new Presbyterian Heritage publication CD. This CD is available from Stillwater's Revival Books. On the web, we are at www.swrb.com. You can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com. Our phone number is 780-450-3730. Thank you.